So I'm Russell Brinson. I'm Arbrins, Russell, Kegar, and Discord. Uh, it's constantly changing, but it's my face with a pink background. Uh, and I'm an IT security specialist at BMW as well. Um, and I don't have to do cloud security, and I'm very thankful for Jason. Uh, but I'm dabbling in pen testing and uh, learning some web app testing. But today, uh, we are taking a slight detour on the privacy um, the privacy series, but still a highly related topic within that. Um, and it's personal threat modeling. And this is a lot like business threat modeling, modeling if you've done that formally. Um, it's just kind of taking a step back and toning it down for the sake of like, what does it mean to be personally responsible for your security? Uh, any questions before we jump in? Are we referring to personal security as far as like home and office or like personal as in your this, personal responsibility as far as the, your employment or business is concerned? Uh, so this is as personal as in family and, yes. and yourself. It okay. can be home and office. Uh, it can be uh, like your, your cyber presence mm -hmm. or anything that you would connect to as you as a human like system connection. Uh, Thank you. Well, I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way. Uh, so by the end of this, you should be able to be your own personal security architect. Um, this is not a technical uh, presentation. However, as we get into some of the topics and discussion, you will soon learn that you have to learn some technical aspects for any level of designing like your security, whether that is physical security for the house or the cyber security for your bank account or protecting your bank account. Um, so understanding what the threat model is, creating your threat model, applying it, and then just further considerations about those first three and uh, doing better over time. Um, so I'm going to start with a definition of threat model from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I think DC A64 is affiliated in some way. We are. We're okay. part of the Electronic Frontier Alliance. All right. So I thought it was appropriate. But uh, I will read this word for word. I won't do that with every slide. So it's like a way of thinking about the sorts of protection you want for your data so you can decide which potential threats you are going to take seriously. And I'm going to break that down some more. And I'm just breaking down the quote here. So it's a way of thinking about. So this is your paradigm. This is the lens that you're looking through your life at um, when you're doing a threat model and it's the sorts of protection so now we're talking about objects or um, or things that are in your life that you're looking at through the security lens and then it says you want for your data so it's about you um, but it can also be about your family or data that you are the custodian of you are the protector of um, or you are working together with someone like a, a spouse significant other uh, or, or like um, like lawyer to to protect your your co-owned or uh, co-facilitated um, assets, and then you decide which potential threats. So these are the things that uh, can do harm to your data. They can affect the security triad, your confidentiality of the data, the integrity of the data or asset, um, and then the availability of that data or asset, and then. You're, you are going to take seriously. This is what you can do about it, what you want to do about it, and everything that encompasses the ability to do something about it. All right. Um, so kind of going back to the, uh, this, this sentence, I think, or this uh, quote, I think is great, but you almost have to work at it through a, a different way. You, you need to classify it into what you're protecting, uh, what are the consequences if you don't protect it, who can affect that, and then what you can do about it. So it's, it's not completely in the same order as the quote. Um, so we're going to look at what you need to protect. Anybody want to throw out some ideas uh, besides these? It can be literally anything that you want to protect. Send me a set of albums or buttons? Yeah. Anyone else? My pets. Yeah. That banking information could probably be expanded to financial information, mm -hmm. including insurance, um, ownership of 
homes, vehicles, planes, and boats. Crypto Rotation. addresses. Yeah, there you go. days, calendar schedules. Yeah. All crypto could be a different thing <laughs> uh, yeah. How is that not financial information? Well, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, those are all like great things, and like the going to the the boat data. It's like, well, you might also want to protect your your boat or your car, and uh, even though that's not necessarily a cyber vector, it might be in the very short term future. But it it might not be a, a cyber vector. It still might be part of your threat model where you need a car to go to work, and so you purchase insurance to cover um, a state regulations and laws, but also um, if something were to happen, you get in a wreck, you now have insurance to cover a giant loss. Um, and that's a way of transferring some risk that we'll talk about later. So you need to know what you're protecting. Take like not 15 minutes now, but take 15 minutes after this presentation and start writing down just some of those things that you know you want to protect. And I would suggest doing it in an Excel sheet with column a as those things you want to protect and it can kind of be loose um, because each column is going to be kind of an application to that what you want to protect and then we're going to look at who is your adversary uh, these are the things that you don't want to have certain aspects of your life and so you don't just have one adversary but pretty much ever um, I know a lot of people are like, I want to protect everything from the government. And that's just such a broad uh, scope and broad statement that it's not really, uh, it's not really true. Like somebody saying that probably doesn't actually mean that to 100% truth. Um, because when you consider what that does mean, you are probably going to live as a hermit um, if that is within your capabilities. And so... Uh, you're looking at what you want to protect your data or assets from. And I, you, you hear about the first three often, the, the government, big tech, your family, um, and friends. But what about work? If you're looking for a new job, I'm not Jason, but if you're looking for a new job, then do you want your employer to know about it? How? What if they find out what's the damage to you? Um, what about crime? So not just cybercrime in the form of ransomware, but somebody breaking into your house, you want to protect your your physical assets there. What can you do in order to uh, protect that? So your adversary there might be like petty crime or, or localized crime. And then natural disasters. Uh, if, if everything, all of your family photos are on one laptop at your house and it gets hit by a tornado and you didn't grab it on the way out, then did you lose everything? And is that an acceptable part of your plan? So this is where the next column, you start listing out your adversaries. And uh, then we kind of go into uh, failure modes and effect analysis. So yes, engineering absolutely has a place here. Uh, this is a, a fancy term, and it means what types of failures can occur. So if you have, if you're protecting family photos, what are some failures to that? Let's say you have them printed out currently. Well, you could have water damage where it completely ruins some fire damage, completely ruined. So one failure mode is like destroyed, physically destroyed. Uh, and then you could have, uh, that was probably a bad example because I think only physically destroyed. No, you, you could have separation of them. You, you They might not be physically destroyed, but you might not be able to access them because you are away and like you, you can't get back for whatever reason. They're not destroyed. You just have an availability issue now. Um, or your kid went through and cut them all in half. And so now you have an integrity issue where you might have to tape them back. And so these are failure modes that can happen where you have physical damage, like total destruction, uh, not being able to access it, um, or disclosure where someone has now scanned all of those and published them to whoever your adversaries, and uh, that's another failure, disclosure. So what happens when a specific failure occurs looks at that failure mode. So one failure can spawn multiple uh, effects. So please please remember that when doing this. And the say the, uh, 
the scanning, the disclosure failure mode, well, what can happen? Well, you could be embarrassed. Um, and like, what, what is the cost to you as a person? It might be a lot, it might not. Um, or it could be uh, you are a high profile engineer that is currently in exile from the nation state that you sold secrets to or not sold secrets to. And now they have location data because they saw you at Table Rock State Park and then downtown Greenville. And they're like, oh, they must be in the upstate because these were taken over different time periods. Um, and so you could have uh, serious um, issues with that kind of disclosure, but it's really specific to you. I don't, like, for example, the, the family photos, if they were um, disclosed, I would be uh, probably slightly embarrassed at some of them, but at the same time, I, I'm not worried about a nation state coming after me, or even my own nation state specifically coming after me for the family photo album. And so... But that literally changes per person for a multitude of very valid reasons. Uh, so as you look at those, those data assets above uh, here, start looking at the columns where you say, what can happen um, that is considered a failure of my protection currently in place? And then what happens as a result of that specific failure? And this is gonna this is gonna turn into a tree really quickly. Uh, so let's do let's do an example here uh, of a personal FMEA. You have a bank with online bill pay, and you pay all of your rent and utilities through that online bill pay. What are some potential types of failures that can occur? This is the first part of the FMEA. Network connectivity failure. Can't pay your bill. Yeah. Misconfiguration of the bill is late and retarded. For sure. And you lose your login information? Yeah. Those are all things that aren't even cybersecurity related, and but still fall into your threat model. These are things that you may consider or may not consider, depending on your levels of personal risk that you're willing to take on. Um, but uh, I, here are some, uh, the ones that I use for the next example. The online portal's down, your account was hijacked, um, and then disclosure of transactions. Let's say they left an S3 bucket on because they stopped using a mainframe. And uh, so what the second part of the FMEA, what happens when these failures occur? So the online portal down, can't pay your bill. You now charge the late fee. So that's an immediate $30 quantifiable uh, transaction that is a result of... Um, you not taking on the the necessary uh, precaution, and that thirty dollars might totally be within your risk, and that is okay for you to say, "I accept that." Um, I'm not saying you have to go out of your way and set up like redundant bill pay and stuff like that. It's just um, these are kind of the thoughts you want to take as you realize your critical assets um, have those failure modes, and then you start asking your questions about. Um, how do I secure this in the future? And the FMEA really helps you dive down into that. The account hijacked and money stolen through bill pay. Again, you probably will get it back um, unless there was some egregious amount of time, but it's still going to be a headache and you still might have to, to eat some of the costs because your, your bank couldn't verify that a couple of transactions were indeed fraudulent. And then disclosure of transactions. Uh, Again, this, this might just be, oh, that sucks. They saw that I spent $120 on HBO Max for the year. Or it, it might be, oh, wow, somebody now sees that I pay $100 or $1,000 in uh, like garnish wages and I'm not going to be able to get a job because they did a background check and this is what showed up. Um, so that, that might be something to consider. Again, depending on your situation, what you spend very legally uh, on can be affected. And then finally, I think we get to, uh, to some of what people would consider the fun part. You get to map your adversaries to what kind of failure they can cause. Um, and also you, you want to look at um, if they can cause it, would they cause it? And I think a great example is this first one up here. It's like, can your work cause you 
cause your bank to use bill pay maliciously. Like, can they they either turn it off, uh, turn it on, and it's like maybe maybe they they have the technical resources to do that, but they're not going to. This is if you're an employee in the U.S. working with a legitimate U.S. Uh, company, you, that's not going to happen, and that's not an adversary you should consider when protecting your bank information necessarily. Um, maybe if you're you're high up in Wells Fargo or something, then you might have more considerations there. Uh, but again, it's all very personal. And try to think of what adversaries you're protecting against and what they can actually do. And I think that's probably uh, one of the most important questions you can ask is what their actual capabilities are to con- create the failure we looked at. And then what do they gain from the failure effect? Um and those are just some examples you can read through later. Uh, and then what are you willing to do about it? <laughs> so we've, we've talked about all the, the terrible things as you map out your personal security and your threat model. Um, and it kind of comes down to how much time are you willing to put in it? Are you willing to learn a new programming language? Are you willing to learn how uh, to, like, it, let's say, criminal, uh, local crime? You're willing to do self-defense? Um, are you are you willing to put money into it in order to maybe buy a sturdier door or buy a subscription to a Bitwarden family? Um, like there's there's a multitude of different things, but I think it's very responsible for you to ask these questions up front because you're going to prevent burnout um, if you start answering these up front instead of as you're getting into it. And there's nothing wrong for you to find something that you love to do. And you're like, you know what? I do want to spend more time in this, but please recognize that that time that you're spending in addition to what you agreed with yourself first is now a hobby. It's not necessarily what makes you more secure to your personal threat model. Um, and then we're going to kind of get into the security controls aspect of it. So um, I think some people will disagree with me here, uh, but I think there's there's three security control types. Uh, you have preventative, detective, responsive. Um, preventative, these are like uh, like your your door being locked. You you cannot enter that door. The door is preventing you to some degree of entering the house. Uh, just like a, a firewall might be preventing you from entering a, a network. But uh, just because you have a door or firewall doesn't mean they're automatically prevented. It is a preventive control, and you need security and depth in order to fully uh, protect that, uh, that failure effect or failure mode. You have detective controls. These are the ones that will usually alert you if it has occurred, but not necessarily stop it. Um, these are good for like bank fraud transactions. You might not want your card. Actually, that's a great example. I didn't think about that until tonight. Uh, but nowadays you can turn your like credit card on and off. That's a preventive control. Um, but you also, when it's on, you have a detective control in the form of fraud. Somebody in the Bahamas uses your card you get a call and it's like, hey, did you do this? And you're like, yeah, I was, I was in the Bahamas that week. That is totally me. Or you're like, no, I'm in Antarctica and totally wish I was in the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so that's, uh, that's a detective control. It doesn't mean that they necessarily stopped it. Um, and then it could also uh, go into responsive controls. And uh, my, my best example here is it's after something has occurred uh, you might not be able to detect that it's a, a bad thing necessarily. So let's say going to a website with like, uh, I don't know, like a Java drive-by that used to happen. And a responsive control might be that your Windows Defender detected malicious activity, but it's already executed. You didn't get an alert saying that it was executing. It's There was behavior that uh, was detected as malicious and it has responded responded usually by shutting it down and alerting you, uh, but it did the responding for you. You didn't have to go in and manually respond. And I know I use a bunch of cyber controls there, but think of it also 
in the terms of your physical uh, security and uh, what you're protecting. So the, the family photo album, if you have it printed out, uh, then a preventive control of it being physically destroyed is to have a copy somewhere else. Um, and that's that's a preventive control. Like you can't destroy one copy and that destroy all the copies. You would have to destroy both. Um, and then working together with security in depth, I think, is always a great principle to follow. Uh, this is where you're layering your controls and you have multiple redundancies of those controls. You don't have to spend tons of money or time on this either. Like a lot of things already uh, kind of starts configuring and working together. Uh, uh, sorry, I think I have another slide on it, but I'm out of order. Um, but you kind of go into systems thinking and where can one control help other failure modes um, and other failure effects. And as you add, say, um, the photo album, you say, I'm going to have a preventive control by having it at a, um, a bank like safe deposit box and one at my house. Um, well, now you have a bank safe deposit box, so you can also store a copy of like, your Bitwarden backup there and on a, a flash drive. And so now you, you've used the same preventive control that you put maybe $30 a month into, and you can now use that for other types of offsite backup where that's a, a control that's needed. Um, and so we kind of put it all together now. Um, what you're protecting from who? Uh, what happens if you don't protect it? And then what are you willing to do about it? Um, again, I think an Excel sheet is a very good thing to use here. Mind mapping is another good one as you start to connect the dots. Um, and then uh, some ops, OPSEC considerations. Uh, so OPSEC is operational security. This is where otherwise harmless data or non-sensitive data when aggregated together can become sensitive or identifying data. Hmm. This last for your social. Exactly. Like by itself might not matter, but then if you have my name, my address, my phone number, you can now open credit cards my name. Well, good, good luck. <laughs> um, but I think a MAC address is another one. Um, and so... It's like, what happens if your MAC address is tied to a coffee house? Probably not too revealing, unless you're trying to hide from someone that has access to coffee, ha coffee house like connection data. Um, but what happens when it's like connected to the coffee house and the bakery? Again, probably not much. But I think this, this is very valid and happens often. Uh, what happens if you have them tied to both? And at the same time, there was like a political rally going on that did vandalism. And now the police have subpoenaed all connection data to everything on that street. And you might not have even participated in it, but now you, you're you caught in the crossfire. Like you might not be charged, but that's a giant headache to deal with. And uh, something that had you, had that been part of your threat model, uh, you might have randomized MAC addresses, and I know iPhone does it by default, Android might nowadays, um, but you, you wouldn't have had to worry about that if that was something uh, that you did. Uh, so yeah, think about data that you might not otherwise think is critical. The takeaway here is data you wouldn't think is critical, you might not have put down at the beginning. Can that still be tied together and used to create a failure mode um, or an effect. And then the system thinking, this is what I wanted earlier. Uh, so siloing mitigations is a great way to burn out. What I mean by that is in that failure effects, if you start saying, um, I'm gonna use a password manager for this effect, I'm gonna use a different password manager, a different password manager, I'm gonna write my password down here. Uh, you are going to burn out because I don't even know if there's four open source password managers that you can use that aren't KeyPass and Bitwarden. Great one. What? Use whatever open source ones oh. are and then make your own. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so yeah, uh, I think the, um, the, the mind mapping here is a really good way to kind of make those connections. Um, and I don't have it on this computer, but I can show you afterwards where I did the kind of mind map when I was using uh, that terribly 
secure and cumbersome operating cubes OS. Uh, and so like I, I mapped out like everything I wanted to do there and it was really cool for like a week and I got burned out because I siloed everything. <laughs> uh, but yeah, th think about how the system can work for you and how you are not working for the system. Um, so go forth and threat model. Remember defense in depth and don't get in lost in the rabbit hole of perfection. And yes. thanks for coming to my TED talk. Nice <laughs> <laughs> job. Any questions? Yeah. Hey, Owen. Uh, so, you know, just to take your bank example, I feel like we could probably sit around here between us for an hour and come up with ways that you can get screwed over with your online bank. Like, it's a rabbit hole of, of never ending. And so how do you how do you decide, okay, this is enough brainstorming on that? And then once I've done enough or once I've, whatever that level is, how do I then prioritize what's the most important? So you're a developer, right? Yeah. So I would A only do this exercise with the people that also care about the assets you're protecting. So bank account might be like a spouse, significant other, whatever. Um, so I would take the chunk of the bank account and then I would get a, a product, a work product, like a, an artifact, and then sanitize it and present it to this group and say, hey, like these are the, the failure modes that I came up for myself. Do you think I'm missing anything? I, I wouldn't brainstorm with us because you're right. We were, we would spend hours <laughs> analyzing like the OAuth login for a bank. Yeah. Um, so yeah, don't don't do it with us. Do it for yourself, um, whoever the data, and then have peer review. And then I would do I would do sprints, and where like a two week sprint of I'm I'm doing a bank for two weeks, and these are the things I'm going to look at. And then maybe another life system. This should not be something you sit down and, and do just in one night. Um, and it should be ever evolving. Um, with the idea is as you start to implement things, you also might have to uh, depreciate other things you implemented before. And it's just kind of the, the agile way of, of leveling up yourself. To me, I mean, terms like sprint or you know, like these are things that don't jive with my wife. It's, it's more like you, you got to operationalize your tactics and you might still employ something like a sprint, but don't give it the framing. The exactly. Notes. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And then my other thought was your technical control or your controls are only going to work if everyone that mm -hmm. is a part of it are on board with it. So like for our household, password managers, I'm okay. I, you know, I'll do my research and I'll have some geeky what reason why I want to use this one over that one. But at the end of the day, it's one that needs to be that I'm okay with, that the wife is okay with, because we, no matter what, need it something that we both can utilize for this model. So it's kind of like you have to factor in your household or if you have children or all of those, you know. Agreed. Yeah. And I think kind of reiterating systems thinking. If your system overlaps with someone else's system, whether they call it a system or not, you need to integrate and have service level agreements. And you don't have to call them that, but you need to have an understanding of what they are also wanting out of this and uh, how receptive they are to change. If fortunately my wife does not care or she doesn't mind using Bitwarden, um, but if she was stuck on like LastPass or something, like I would probably grit my teeth and just use LastPass, even though I think it's inferior in every way to Bitwarden, uh, because of that, that same reason. Like if she's already using it and she's not the the security minded one, mm -hmm. then that's what I'm going to go with because it's not terrible in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, um, if I may, I think that's the that's the push and pull, right? That's the uh the usability, usability versus security, especially when you bring it home to someone that's not as technical as you, is that what you just said, Russell, is I am stuck using LastPass <laughs> because it is the ease of use, right? So usability versus security is like my thing. On the response side, never let a good disaster go to waste. 
So <laughs> at the time that something takes place and your life is impacted by something that whether you intended to have a control around it or not, by that event happening, you usually have that buy-in or a little bit more willingness to say, all right, you know, man, last pass got hacked and it wasn't secure. We need to look at something that can change the game for us. And now we can now shift off of something that before was a convenience that we had concessions on. Not the last pass has been hacked to note that it didn't happen. I see the point. The never let that disaster go to waste. If that didn't happen in your life. Should I stop recording my screen now? Is that okay? Yeah. I'm still recording for a few more minutes. I do have a question All right. about resources. We could go down this rabbit hole for more than one hour. We could go for days and weeks, potentially for all the time. So, have you found in your your general world, and since you presented on this, you have become the subject matter expert. Correct. Uh, have you found any resources that could help someone get started on this and and improve their their daily life? In this? Uh, one thing I'm thinking of is. The CRS controls exist for IT stuff. The NIST stick exist for for really specific operating systems and devices and things such. Is there one for this? For this topic? Regarding the, the sticks, I don't think so. I like NIST the the SCF for uh, for like family cybersecurity, but I'm a nerd like that um, because I think it's really applicable to to any level of organization. And I do like to try to run uh, like family projects and finances as though it were a business, mostly because I'm a nerd and business undergrad, uh, but also because it helps me conceptualize and apply uh, stuff like that a little bit better. If like I'm from the nerd side, not saying you have to do this, but like I'm looking at doing an LDAP implementation across the home network. Um, and like part of that is also like now I can do remote uh, like engineer like uh, configuration updates and stuff, and maybe look at CIS for using it in the home setting. So you can go use literally enterprise configurations if you want to. Um, but also, uh, I think so. A Electronic Frontier Foundation. Here's surveillance self defense. I think they have some profiles here that. Uh, that kind of take a lot of that work off your hands. Um, and and I, wish, I wish I knew where it was. If you find it, and if you have any of these links today, drop them into the video chat. Okay. Oh, yeah, here, here's this. So the, uh, the security scenarios, it's like, are these, are you one of these people? And like academic researcher, and it kind of outlines like what you need to, to know about and learn about. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of like a, a stig for your persona. Um, and just because you're an academic researcher doesn't mean that these others don't also apply to you. That's where you start seeing the overlap of security controls that come into place because you as a person is not just a researcher or your, your job description. You, and you know that. I just feel there's no Linux user. No, <laughs> no, no, because all of these recommend yeah. all of these recommend going to Linux. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trend. Um, and then TechLore, I I personally really like this. I listen to the surveillance surveillance report almost weekly, uh, but it's all about uh, privacy and personal privacy, and they have a free course on YouTube, or you can pay uh, for not the monetized stuff. Um, I paid because I thought it was cool, um, but it really is like the same thing on YouTube if, if you can't afford it. Uh, and here's their, their syllabus, and it talks about uh, a lot of the same things we covered in a little bit more detail, and each step has like a, a take-home homework assignment, like a PDF helps you kind of map that way. Uh, while also, I uh, think... If you have a second, can you check your screen share? I don't see you transmitting video. I'm not transmitting. Okay, so anything you're showing here is not... Oh, wait, no. Remote. 
It's not... Okay. Yeah. You were right. You know. Still on the system. <laughs> Alright, so I was, I was just showing the, the tech lore, uh, the Go Incognito here, and then their core syllabus, and before that I was showing the surveillance self-defense at electronicfrontierfoundation.org. Uh, and then I think the last thing I would look at would be privacyguides.org. Uh, that is a list of a bunch of cyber tools you can use um, in various, again, security in-depth uh, configurations. Um, and I would also recommend that as a source. And I'll put all those links in Discord as well. To key, just off, related to the EFF, we'll probably run a poll, but one of the things we can do as a member of the EFA is we can get some speakers from the EFF or from other like, alliance participants to come and have a talk here too. So what we'll probably do is like run a poll and just categorize some topics and then use that to kind of have that communication with the EFF to say, hey, we got interest in this one type of topic that you guys cover. Could you, you know, align up a talk or a presentation and we have one of our meetings driven from them where they host and go over something in depth? Because they cover a lot. And they have a lot of good tools, but some of them you do have to kind of find. Whereas others, this is a, a good resource that I saw well, like, earlier this year. Like this. Yeah. I don't know if you can get Micah F. Lee in, but I've always wanted to hear him talk. He used to be the, like the, the, the public like CISO, um, like content, I guess CISO for EFF? Maybe he's he's affiliated with them somehow. Somewhere. Uh, now he's a reporter and chief information security officer for the Intercept. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, we're out of time in two minutes. Anyone remote? All right. I'm gonna stop sharing. I'll stop recording.